you have to do that every day, man. A lot of us are very, you, you become complacent. You become very civilized in life. You know, the worst thing that can happen to a person is you become civilized. When you get to that point where you believe that you've arrived, when you, my God, man, I'm up there near Michelle Obama on my book. I've done it, man. I'm good. I don't have to be a wildland firefighter, man. I retired from the military. I ain't, got, I ain't got to go out there and dig fire line for three miles. I'm 43, man. I've done it. And that's exactly when it's over. I'm not saying you can go as hard as you did when you were 20 or not 43, but there's a new bar that you must always set in your life. And once you become complacent and you become civilized, you've arrived, you're no good for anybody. I go back to the sewer, and the sewer is that $7 a month place I once lived in as a young kid. So even though, mentally, mentally, and I always talk about it, I talk about I'm always paying rent in that $7 a month place where I grew up, in that nasty little place I grew up in, I remember it. I remember like it was yesterday, and I'm glad I do. I never want to forget the dungeon of where I come from. Even though it's real spooky and it's scary and there's no lights on in there and there's cobwebs and some creepy motherfuckers in there, some demons, all those motherfuckers in there made me Goggins, made me who I am today. That's where the strength came from. You gotta go back to the beginning, to, to the fundamentals of life, is I cannot get away from who the fuck I am. Who I am is who I'm proud of. I'm very proud of the hardworking, calloused hands, calloused mind, human being, that I literally made this person with a lot of help from above, a lot of guidance from saying, you're gonna go left when you should go right. That horrible voice that wouldn't let me get away from myself and hide forever. I listened to it. I listened to it. And the only way you can set the example is you have to always be willing to work. I don't follow people who talk about what they used to do in life. I don't give a fuck what you used to do. I don't care that you know you used to be the bass mother. I don't care. What are you doing today? You may not be that person now, but what are you still doing to try to excel in life? And a lot of people now are talking. I hear so much talk. I don't hear a lot of work. I hear a lot of people telling you what you should be doing, how you should be doing it, how you should be fucking living. And I look at them and you're fat, you're out of shape, you look like shit, but you're telling the motherfucker how to live. No, man, I won't listen to you. There's so many people speaking this shit and that's what bothered me a lot in the military. There's a lot of people talking shit. I don't see the real suffering behind it, behind what you're saying. That's why I said, man, you talk with so much passion because it's a real fucking place. It sucks to get up in the morning time. There was raining like cats and dogs. I want to get my shoes on and go run. But guess what? I got my shit on and ran. What you don't have is you haven't prioritized your life correctly. We all have time. We all have time. What you've done wrong is that you you didn't prioritize yourself. You didn't prioritize that, look, motherfucker, I got to get up and win this war today against myself. I need to look better. I need to feel better. I need to eat better. I need to prioritize time. It's unreal how much time you waste during the day. And most of it is on these fucking computers, phones, you know, Instagramming back and forth, whatever the fuck you call it shit nowadays, tweeting and texting and shit. We waste so much time on our little gadgets. It's unreal. And we talk about we have no time. If you really take, you have to take your day and write, write down this one day. Everything you do, write that down. And you're like, my God, I am wasting so much time on frivolous bullshit. It's not even funny. I mean, it will, it will, if it doesn't infuriate you, it should. Because there's so much time. I can't get it in. Look at your schedule. You just wasted seven hours a day on bullshit. I mean, and you don't have an hour a day to try to get something in for yourself. I guarantee everybody can find an hour. It's, it's fucking miserable. It, it is miserable. I mean, to get up every day or five days a week, whatever, when it's snowing, shiny, not, not shiny, not, not, not comfortable, and to go in the gym and work out when you don't want to go to the gym, it is not fun. If you don't see results in the first two days or the first week, I'm done. That's the mentality of most people. The struggle is too real. We're not patient. We Like in a world where you can Google the best restaurants around me right now, no one is patient. And for you to lose weight, for you to stop drinking, if you where the hell you're going through, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, and a lot of pitfalls, a lot of plateaus. You're gonna hit so many fucking plateaus. If you don't know how to get around that plateau, it's not gonna happen fast.
Sacrifice, what does that mean, sacrifice? Well, it's a discovery, man. It's the discovery of the future. It's like the future is actually the place where there is threat. And it's always going to be there. So what do you do? You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better. Right. Everyone does that. That's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing here. That's what your parents are doing when they pay money to send you to university. They think, you can bargain with reality. It's amazing. You can bargain with reality. You can forestall gratification now. And it'll pay off at a, at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet. It's like, who would have believed that? It's like, that's a miracle that that occurs. And it's not like people just figured that out overnight. You know, we were chimps for Christ's sake. Like, how are we going to come up with an idea like that? Well, it's like, well, we thought about it for seven million years. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we could kind of act it out. But we didn't know what we were doing. But it was a, it emerged just like a dream. It was, so the terror of the future is a dream. And the solution to the terror, the dream of the terror of the future, is another dream. And, and it, it comes out in mythology and in fantasy and in drama, where you act out the sacrifice. And then it's a step on the way to full understanding. So we can say sacrifice now instead of doing it, you know, although we still do it. It's just not concretized like it used to be. We do it abstractly. And we all have faith that it will work. You know, and we also set up our society so that it'll work. And one thing about, you know, I'm not a fan of moral relativism for a variety of reasons, partly because I think it's an, it's an extreme form of cowardice. But anyways, apart from that, no, 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 no. There's minimal ways that you can set up a society that will work. And so one of them is, is that the society has to be set up so that your sacrifices will pay off or you won't work. And then the society will... And so it has to make promises. People have to make promises to one another. And that's what money is. Money is a promise that your sacrifice will pay off in the future. That's what money is. And so if the society is stable, you can store up your work right now. You can sacrifice your impulses and you can work and you can store up credit for the future. And then you can make the future a better place. But society has to be stable enough to allow for that. Hyperinflation will do you in. So the promise that's implicit in the currency is the promise that what you're doing now will pay off in the future. And if people don't have that promise, then, well, we know what they do. Because in, in gangs, for example, in, say, gangs in North America, the time horizon of the gang members shrinks rapidly because they don't really expect to be alive much past 21. And so they get really impulsive and, and like, why the hell not? That's, that's what you do when, when the future doesn't matter when it's not real you you default back to living in the moment and you take what you can get right now and no wonder because you don't know if you're gonna be around in a, in a year and you get whatever you can well you can bloody well get it and that's like anarchy that state and so you don't want to live in some people like to live in that state because they're really wired for that you know and so they're they're much more comfortable in those conditions they're they're kind of like warrior types I would say in some sense but you know, for most people, that's just, well, that stress will just do you in, you know, the stress of a life like that. Discipline as the precondition for freedom, right, which is, which, is a, which is actually a Nietzschean idea, at least in part. I mean, it's older than that. It's the apprenticeship idea. It's that, it's that before, before you can be a painter who can paint what's beyond mere memory, you, you have to inculcate that discipline skill, and a lot of that is painful repetition and hard grinding work. It's the sacrifice of the present for the future. But once you manage that, then things open up. And, and virtually everything you learn of value is like that's very, very, very difficult to learn to write. And there's arbitrary, arbitrary rules that you have to follow and bind yourself to. And while you're learning those rules, the probability that you have any creative freedom to speak of or any facility with the rules is very low. You're a, you're a rank beginner. and and even to some degree, whatever creativity you have is going to have to be stifled while you're passing through that, that keyhole. But if you pass through it, then something massive opens up on the other side. That's why we have disciplines, right? I mean, the words aren't there by accident. You have to narrow yourself first, and then you can broaden outward.
Thank <laughs> you.